Romans chapter 11, verse number 33. It almost goes along with the song we just heard. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been His counselor? Or who hath first given to Him? And it shall be recompensed unto Him again. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Father, we pray You might bless the time as we look into the Scriptures, that You might bring understanding and insight, that we might be, have a better perception and a better vision of Your book and of Your plan, and we might fit into that plan like we're supposed to. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What we're going to do this morning, we're going to go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I am watching the clock because I understand your blessed assurance may get a little sore. So... We are going to be time conscious, but what I want to do, make use of the chart that you see, and some of you are too far back, you really can't make heads or tails of it, but basically what this is, is a chart of the ages from the beginning of the Bible to the end, and obviously we can't be exhaustive, we can't cover the entire Bible in a 45 minute message, and our purpose is not to cover the entire Bible, our purpose is to give you maybe some insight and maybe a general insight of some things to maybe help you fit some of the pieces of the puzzle together as you study the Bible and have a better understanding. Uh, This is not a question thing, so don't be throwing your hand up. I will not call on you. Um, This is a quick summary of the Bible. We're going to give the storyline of the Bible, some of the theme of the Bible, and the purpose of this book that we have. The purpose of the Bible is to reveal the plan and program of God. And that's what we're going to talk about some this morning. You'll notice here from the very beginning of our chart, we have these, these earths up here, these, these worlds. And in the middle, obviously, it says the present earth. So what this is, is we have the physical world and the ages laid out. You'll notice you have four on this side and you have four on that side. You also notice those of you that are close enough, these are judgments. Judgment of God, judgment of God, judgment of God, and judgment of God. So four of these have specific judgments. Here's the beginning, there's the end. It starts with a perfect world, it ends with a perfect world as we find in the book of Revelation. The Bible is a complete circle. Satan shows up here, he shows up, he's banished over there. So everything lines up and what we're going to do is go through this in a a little bit of a, a quick fashion, but to give you a general overview of the entire Bible. It starts out like this, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And when God made the heaven and earth, He didn't make it messed up. He didn't make it ruined. Verse number 2 says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's not how God created it. He created it perfect. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that He formed it to be inhabited. And so when He created the world, we understand that it was perfect, and we believe also Genesis 1-1, space-time thing that Einstein kind of figured out. In the beginning, God created. What's before that? God's before that. I am that I am. I don't understand that, neither do you, because we think in in segments of time. Everything about us is time because it was put in motion there. But in the beginning, he created the heaven and the earth. And we understand from 2 Peter chapter number 3, some things happen. The first personage, not human, personage that committed sin was Satan. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 14, he said in his heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the sides of the congregation, the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will be like the most high. When he did that, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, God banished him. And when God did that, something took place to this earth because the Bible tells us that when He made this, the sons of God shouted for joy. So when we begin to look at the Bible originally, what did God do? God created a perfect earth with Lucifer as an anointed cherub over the throne of God and these sons of God, which we would later come to know as angels, over this earth. We know that because when Adam was created, God said you need to replenish the earth. You go put gas in your gas tank, you're replenishing something that was already there. Somebody was on this earth before Adam showed up. It was Lucifer and the sons of God. So some of the things I believe you find in the fossil record, some of the things I believe the scientists are finding today, it's going all the way back to here. That's why they think the earth is 4.5 billion years old. It's not 4.5 billion years old from here. It's 4.5 billion from there. 
if they're measuring things are right. In the universe, around 14 billion. In the beginning, God makes it. He creates Lucifer, he creates the sons of God, everything's fine. Lucifer as the anointed cherub, which means Messiah, by the way. He was a special cherub. Uh, Ezekiel chapter number 10, Ezekiel chapter 1 talks about these creatures. They're, they're uh, mentioned around the throne, and Satan evidently was special. He was exalted. He was uh, over the throne of God in his body. The Bible describes him that he had these jewels all in his body. He even had musical instruments in his body. So he was like a choir leader. And the Bible speaks about the sons of God singing on the creation morning. And so he led that and he reflected the light of God. That's why his name is Lucifer, which means light bearer. And when God kicked him out of heaven, the Bible says the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Judgment fell from God. Second Peter chapter 3 chronicles it. It talks about the heavens and earth which were old, were out of the water and in the water. The heavens and earth were destroyed, it says in 2 Peter chapter number 3. This destruction is a water judgment, just like you have over here with Noah. But it's a lot different here because this destruction not only impacted the earth, but it impacted how we know the uh, universe as we see it now because it mentions the darkness. We know God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. When you go outside at night and you look and you see all the blackness, you're looking at what we're in. We're in this universe now that is outside of where God is. God is separate from his creation. When that took place here, he separated himself from his creation and he pushed this world out into what's known now as the firmament that you read about in Genesis chapter number 1. The same firmament that has the sun, the moon, and the stars in it. There are two firmaments in Genesis 1. One is the firmament where the sun, the moon, and the stars are in. The other is the firmament where the birds fly and where the clouds are. This first firmament is the firmament the earth is in. That's outer space. That's darkness. Every planet and everything that you see out there shows signs of catastrophe. You look at the moon. It's full of craters. It's full of judgment. And that didn't happen just in the past few thousand years. So you have signs of a catastrophe that took place. Second Peter chapter 3 is the main text. Because it wouldn't be describing Noah's flood because the heavens and earth were of old. The earth standing out of the water and in the water. The heavens and earth which are now. Noah's flood took place 1,700 years. He said from the beginning of the creation in Second Peter chapter number 3. So obviously he's not dealing with Noah. Noah's 1,700 years after Genesis chapter number 1 verse number 3. So we have an obvious destruction that takes place on the earth. Satan sinned. The sons of God were destroyed. And, and the Lord pushed that thing out. And that thing was put away from him without form and void. Darkness upon the face of the deep. And there it is. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 3 through chapter number 2. You have the beginning of the covenants. Now the, way, the best way to get a good overview of the Bible is not to try to, okay, I've got to learn this book and learn that book and learn the other book. God makes certain covenants with man. And when God makes covenants, covenants are not an agreement. That's like me saying, hey, I want to make an agreement with you. I'm going to put up this fence right here as long as you don't cross over this fence. Okay? I'm going to make an agreement with you. I'll give you $500 today. And I'll give you another $500 tomorrow for your lawnmower. Okay? Let's shake on it. Let's make an agreement. God makes agreements or covenants with man all through the Bible. And there are basically eight covenants. And you'll see them outlined up here. The first covenant takes place in the Garden of Eden. And the first covenant is when he makes man, he creates Adam. The Bible says, in his own image made he man, male and female created he them. So when God created Adam, he created him out of the dust of the earth. And Adam is said to be in Luke chapter number 3, not just a man. The Bible calls Adam in Luke chapter number 3. And by the time, by the way, you can see how fast we're moving. We're not turning through our Bibles. Luke chapter number 3, Adam is called a son of God. What are these beings called here in Job 38 and Genesis chapter number 6? What are they called? They're called sons of God, these angels. So when Adam is made, he's said to be a son of God. He told Adam, multiply, replenish the earth. This first order that we made, this first thing that we made, it ended in judgment right here. So now I'm making a new order. I'm going to create man in my own image. Angels are not made in the image of God. Man's made in the image of God. What do you mean? The Bible says God said let us make man in our image, plural. The word Elohim is the word for God and that's a plural ending on it. Im, just like cherubim, plural. So Elohim is a plural word. The word for God's plural. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's a soul, there's a spirit, there's a body. God the Father represents the soul. The Holy Spirit, obviously the spirit. Jesus Christ is the body of God. So when he created Adam, he had three parts to him. Body, soul, and spirit. 
made in the image of God. He says, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. By the way, Adam, there's this tree of life over here, and that's great and grand, but there's also this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat it. The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You know the story. Here we are. Adam took, uh, Eve took of the fruit thereof. She fell prey to Satan's temptation, and she took it, and she gave it to her husband with her, and he did eat, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked, and they hid themselves, and the Lord God among the trees of the garden. We know what took place. They took of that forbidden fruit, so they failed the test. God said, here's your salvation. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate it. They messed up. What did he do after that? He put a flaming sword in front of that tree, and he also put cherubim there to guard it. I don't know how long it was there. Maybe the 1,700 years before the flood came. I don't know. We know in Ezekiel there's some other passages that talk about Eden and the center of the earth. Where's the tree of life now? I don't know, but it does show up in the book of Revelation toward the end. So the, the covenant made in the Garden of Eden, they failed. And in that covenant, there's some things that are given. He tells them about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He tells them about the tree of life. And in that Edenic covenant, he gives a promise whenever they sin. What takes place next is what we call the Adamic covenant. In other words, you go from the Garden of Eden to he's kicked out of the garden. He's expelled from the garden. Now Adam goes out and hears thorns and thistles. And now instead of just picking picking fruit off the tree, now he's got to dig the ground, put the potato in in the ground and watch it come up. Put the bean in the ground and watch it come up. Everything comes from the ground which is cursed. No wonder we die. Well, I'm going to be a vegetation. I'm not going to eat. I'm a vegetarian. I'm not going to eat of, of meat, so then I'll live forever. No, you won't. You're still eating lettuce. You're eating stuff that comes out of the ground. The ground's cursed. So he goes, and now he makes a covenant with Adam. Adam's out there running from God, and God says, Adam, where are thou? says, here I am. You know, I took of the fruit of the... Did you eat of the tree? Yeah, she did it. And she goes, Satan did it. You know, everybody's pointing at everybody else. And he says, okay, if I'm going to fellowship with you, you can't just be wearing these fig leaves, man. That's not in style. <laughs> No, the fig leaves represent self-righteousness, Romans chapter number 10. The fig leaves represents the nation of Israel, which are self-righteous. And fig leaves was what Adam and Eve tried to do to make themselves acceptable to God. God said, that's not going to work. So God takes a little lamb and he kills it. And he skins that lamb. And he covers them with skin. He covers them because of the bloodshed of an animal. That's the first atonement or sacrifice that's made in the Bible. And that's the Adamic covenant. And in that covenant, you know what he reveals in Genesis chapter 3? He reveals the promise of a future seed that's going to come and fix the problem that has taken place with Adam. He tells Satan, he says that uh, there's uh, there's going to be a seed of the woman that's going to bruise your head. You're going to bruise his heel and he's going to bruise your head. A seed of a woman... No woman ever had a seed. The man carries the seed. Everybody knows that who studies birds and the bees one-on-one. There's only one woman that ever walked the face of this planet that had a seed without a man being involved, and her name was Mary. And that's the Holy Ghost that came upon her, and she was conceived of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ came. So the first prophecy we find of Christ is 4,000 years before he shows up, Genesis 3.15. So that's the Adamic covenant. He makes a covenant, and now he has to come before God with sacrifice. And God, uh, you know, Adam's in trouble because he something's not right with him. He used to be in fellowship with God back in the garden, but now he's not. And things aren't like they used to be because he told Adam, in the day that you eat thereof, you're going to die. What happened to Adam the day that he ate of it? He didn't die. The Bible says in Genesis 5, 5, he lived 930 years. Remember, atmospheric conditions were different before the flood. I believe the axis wasn't tilted the way it is now. Things were different before the flood because the Bible says there was not a hydrologic cycle. It doesn't say it in those terms. But it says a mist came up from the earth. You didn't have clouds and condensation and all that. You had a mist, a watering system that came up. That's how the thing was set up. People lived to be a lot older in that time. Adam lived to be 930 years old, so if God told him in the day that you eat there, if you're going to die, did God lie? No, he didn't lie. He did die. His body didn't die, but his spirit died. That's why Jesus said you had to be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. I had a day that I came, I came into life, not physical life. I came into eternal life, and my spirit was born again when I got saved. So Adam died spiritually that day, and the Bible says by man came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead, which is Christ. But Adam passed that curse on to all of us. All of us have a father, an earthly father. I don't care if you're black, yellow, white, whatever you are, that trace is all the way back to Adam and Adam's sin, and that sin is in the blood of all of us. So the Adamic covenant shows us our sin. It also gives us the promise of a future Redeemer that will come. Well, about 1,700 years go by. 
And in that time, Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and it grieved him at his heart continually. And he said, I will, de- I will destroy man whom I've created off the face of the earth. God said, I'm, I'm fed up with this. Look what they're doing. Not only that, the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 6, there was a, a, a visitation, if you want to call it that. Visitors from outer space. He said, what are you talking about, preacher? Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The same became mighty men. Men of old, men of renown, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. These sons of God, these angels that left their first estate, Jude verse number 14, they came down and they mingled with man and they were able to reproduce. You say, what's taking place? I'll tell you what's taking place. Watch the theme as we go through here. God created Satan and created these, these sons of God. They rebelled against God. He judged it. They are not out in the lake of fire for eternity. They're still somewhere. Some people have ideas that demons may come from these these destroyed creatures. I don't know where demons or devils come from. Having said that, when Adam's on the earth, you know what Satan tells Eve when he tempts her? He says, eat this fruit. If you eat this, you'll be like God's. Why did he say that? That's weird. You get in Genesis chapter number 6, these sons of God are on the earth, these angels. And they're able to reproduce with women, and they come giants. You say, well, that's just the ungodly line. That's just unsafe people and safe people. Don't be silly. You ever know of an unsafe person and a safe person that got married and had kids? Their, kid, their, their, their children went nine and ten feet tall. Goliath was nine feet tall, and he was a remnant of the giants. So you have something taking place on the earth where Satan and the sons of God are trying to create a super race to rebel against God Almighty and to destroy man on the earth and to take things back over. By the way, Daniel chapter number 2 mentions that this will take place again along with Revelation chapter number 13. There are ten kings that are going to come on the scene in the book of Revelation, and they are not all human. In Revelation chapter 9, you read about these creatures that come up out of the earth, and not only do they have animal features, they have human features. What's the big thing today? The big thing today has to do with genetics and DNA. And I guarantee you, we have cloned people walking around. Maybe they're not here, but they've done it. Don't tell me they, didn't do, they did a sheep and they didn't do a person. You study some of the things Hitler was doing back in the 40s. I guarantee it's a lot further along now than you realize. Well, what took place here? Well, the judgment gets ready to fall. 1,700 years go by. God saw the wickedness of man in the earth. He saw what was taking place with these, these sons of God and these daughters of men. And these giants were being born. He said, I'm going to destroy every one of them. But the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And when Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, God spared Noah and he told him, look, you build a boat and you get on it. And so Noah did. He builds this ark, he gets on, he's a type of someone that goes through the tribulation. Because what you'll notice with these, here we are right in the center, you'll notice all of these match each other. You have the original earth, you have the new earth. You have an earth that's destroyed there, you have the earth that's burned here because he gave a promise he'd never flooded out by water. It was flooded out by water the first time there, the second time here, because in Psalm, David talks about judgment and wrath being typified with somebody drowning. That's when Christ said to the disciples, you want to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? He's talking about the suffering of the wrath of God on the cross. When you get baptized, it's not just a picture of death and burial. Well, it is, but a picture of death. Why is it death? Because it's the old man going under the wrath of God. He doesn't do it the second time. He he burns it the second time over here. So you've got these match, and then you have this restored earth here. That matches the earth that's regenerated during the millennium. Here you have a flooded earth. That matches a distressed earth, just like in the tribulation. Some of the things that will take place during the great tribulation, as detailed in the book of Revelation, match that. Then you've got us right here in the middle. So here comes the flood. It, it drowns out everything that has the breath of life. Noah, Noah survive, survives. Him and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they get off the boat. Everything's going great. He's got his three sons, and he tells him the same thing he told Adam. Exactly. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish. Same three things he told Adam. Why does he say that? Because the same thing that happened right before Noah got off the boat happened before Adam showed up. A destruction of the earth, a flood of water. You'll notice when you begin to compare these things, both Adam and Noah are told to replace races that God had judged. Both are told to replenish the earth. Both had three named sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Cain, Abel, and Seth. One of those sons, a type of the Antichrist, Cain and Ham, and one's a type of Christ, which is Abel and Shem. Both are naked in a garden. Uh, Adam is naked in a garden and he sins. 
Uh, Noah, the Bible says he was uncovered in a vineyard, and he sinned. Both sinned with forbidden fruit. One of them takes this forbidden fruit, which the Bible never says it's an apple. That's just an old wives' tale. The closest thing it would be compared to is a grape because Adam, uh, Noah's in the garden and he uh, is in that vineyard, in that vineyard rather, and he takes a forbidden fruit, which is wine, and he's drunken. And both follow a flood. So those things are, are, are very similar. So the flood of destruction comes on the earth. He gets off the ark. Shem, Ham, and Japheth are there. They go out, multiply, replenish the earth. Everything's great, right? Now we're going to have things straightened out. We got rid of all that, that mayhem that was taking place for those first 1,700 years. We're off to a great start. Except man gets together. Man says, you know what? We're just going to have a big party. We're going to get together and we're going to be innovative and we're going to build some things and we're going to grow and we're going to, we're going to become, we're, you know, man's the measure of all things. Look at us. Look how we are good, well, we're doing. And they build a tower at a place called Babel. The Tower of Babel is built and they go up there. We're going to exalt ourselves above the throne of God like Isaiah 14. That, that common denominator, that thread runs all the way through here. We're going to become God. We're going to find out where heaven is. We're going to send out the rocket ships, you know, and all this kind of stuff. We're going to exalt ourselves. And God says, really? And the Lord says, I don't like that. The Lord never likes it when man gets together because when man always tries to bring everybody together, they bring everybody together and kick God out. That's what they do. So God says, you know, you think that's pretty good? You're going to get together? I'm going to split you up. And he busts them up. Shem, Ham, and Japheth represent the three main races of the world. And he busts them up and he splits them out. And after he does that, Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 11, when you, find, when you hit Genesis chapter 12, everything changes. I mean, you've come all the way up here for now, and everything's pretty much just everybody on the earth. Now God has busted up the people groups, and then he picks one man named Abram. And he says, you know what, I'm going to take one man, and I'm going to bless him and his family only. Everybody else to blazes with them, basically. I'm going to bless this man. I'm going to give him the truth. If anybody else wants the truth, they've got to come to them. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless them that bless you. I'm going to curse them that curse you. In these shall all families of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 4. And he goes through, and what he does is he sets up the covenant made with Abraham. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. And he gives a promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he's going to give them a specific piece of land, and it's not that little tiny piece of land you see over there today called the state of Israel. It's a whole lot bigger than that. And it's given in an unconditional promise. He doesn't say, Abraham, if you do this and if you do that and if you do the other, I'll bless you. He says, Abraham, I'm giving this to you. Despite what the UN says about it, despite what the Arabs say about it, despite what the United States says about it, I'm giving this to you. And so he blesses him and he gives him this promise, sends him out as a pilgrim and so forth. Abraham, he goes down into Egypt, he gets out of the will of God, some different things happen, some judgments take place, his seed winds up down in Egypt. You read about Joseph at the end of Genesis chapter number 40 through 50 there, they're down there in Egypt. You open up the book of Exodus and there they are, they're in Egypt and they're slaves down in bondage. Down in Egypt. And God has to bring them out of Egypt. And what does He do? He brings up Moses. And here comes Moses. And things begin to change a little bit. Because now we move from the Abrahamic covenant. Which, by the way, is never done away with. What you're going to find is overlaps. Remember what He told Adam over here? He said, Dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Is that still in effect? People still die? Okay. Remember what He told Noah? Look up in the sky. I'm going to give you a what? Rainbow? It's still in effect. You ever seen a rainbow? We saw one the other day. It's still in effect. These covenants overlap. Some of the things within the covenants overlap. But now he pulls out Moses and he says, Okay, Moses, we're going to bring Israel out of Egypt, but we're going to have to do this thing as a nation. Now they come up as a corporate entity. And they have an army and they have a leader. And Moses is actually called, said to be a king, although he's not technically the first king. But he's said to be a king in Jeshurun. So here comes Moses and he comes up and they, he gives them the law. The reason he gives them the Ten Commandments and the law is because they get away from God. It's kind of like you parents in here and kids. Listen, your parents are not always contriving and thinking of ways. How can I make their life miserable? I'm going to come up with this chore and I'm going to come up with that chore. No. Most of the time what they're having to do is to do those things to keep you in line. Because if they just let you run free, you'd be a hellion. I mean, really. So what happens is they come out of Egypt and... They're starting to follow all, the, you know, the Bible says a mixed multitude went up with them, so they got some of these Egyptians coming up. Now they're starting to worship these false gods. You read Exodus, you know all the stuff in there. And the Lord says, hey, we've got to deal with this. And the Bible reveals back in the New Testament about this, why he had to do this, because of their sin. The law was added because of transgression. I mean, what if we didn't have red lights and stop signs? 
You know, well, you know, I understand this. You know, I, I, we shouldn't have speed limits. That's against my constitutional rights. What if we didn't? I mean, really? Absolute mayhem. God has to put boundaries to keep things going here. So he does. He sets up the Mosaic Covenant. Now, under this Mosaic Covenant, there are some conditions in the land about them staying in the land. has nothing to do with the Abrahamic Covenant, however. It's called the Palestinian Covenant, Deuteronomy 27, 28. So when you read about this Mosaic Covenant, it has to do with all those rituals and ordinances and ceremonies back in the Old, in the Old Testament law. You read about them in Leviticus. And people say, well, he's got issues. Read Leviticus, you'll find out what issues really are. And you won't be saying that all the time. But it gives all kind of things about diseases, about leprosy, about all these kind of things. It gives all the, Lord, the ordinances and laws. Homosexuality, for instance, if somebody was a queer, they took them out and killed them. They got rid of that problem. If somebody killed somebody, they took them out and they instituted capital punishment. By the way, capital punishment is over here before the law. When Noah comes off the boat, he says, okay, now you can take a man's life. If somebody, takes, if somebody kills somebody, now you take their life. They didn't do it with Cain, remember? He didn't kill Cain. He put a mark on it. Sent him out and Cain started the first city. Cities come from Satan. God puts everything in a garden. There's going to be a real city one day. This is a heavenly city that God's going to found. But Cain goes out and he, he opens the first grocery store. Because he can't work in the yard anymore. God won't bless it anymore. He has to, he has to become a city boy. Anyway, God doesn't kill Cain, but capital punishment shows up over here. And it goes through the Mosaic system. And then over here in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle says, If I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. So what should we do with those guys on death row? Feel sorry for them? Hey, try to get the gospel to them. Get them saved. But after you get them saved, fry them. Hook them up, man. Quit giving them three meals a day. You want to take care of some, some uh, economic problems, man? Take them out, man. You want to deter some future crime? Hang them up there and let some kids see that. I just can't believe you'd say that. God said it, not me. He instituted capital punishment and he paid, would take them out and they would hang them up on the tree and let everybody see it. Before the sun was set, they'd take them down. That's in the Bible there, the Bible you're supposed to be reading. All right, so we got the Mosaic Law. Now, under this Mosaic Law, we have some things that are given, like the Sabbath. It's a sign for the Jews, and we have these ordinances and all this stuff that has to do. They couldn't eat mullet. Good night, man. They couldn't have catfish and different things, you know. So they have these different rules and ordinances that are set up under that Mosaic Covenant. Then we move on to King David, because remember what was prophesied way back in Genesis. Not only was a seed promised to come... But there was a prophecy in Genesis 49 of a king that would come one day. And this king was going to come of the tribe of Judah, and he would come of the lineage of King David. So we have the trail of the kingdom. We have the trail of the kingdom. And if you follow this, I'm sure you can't see it from back there. We have the different kings that show up. And we have the trail of the kingdom. And it goes to what we call the Davidic covenant. This is another covenant God makes with David. Psalm 89 records some of the details of this covenant. And he tells David, look, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless your seed. And he's going to sit on your throne and rule and reign over Israel and over the world forever. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Isaiah chapter 9. So he gives all the details, and that's a covenant given to David, and it's under the Mosaic Covenant, and it has application with the Abrahamic Covenant, obviously, but it has to do with ruling, it has to do with a king, because this whole theme that we've been studying is all about authority, who's ruling, who's reigning. Satan says, I'm going to take over, God says, no you're not. He judges that thing, Satan shows up on the earth, and he goes over to Adam, and what did God tell Adam? He said, Adam, you're going to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, of the beast of the earth. Dominion. What does a king have? Dominion. Satan says, I don't like him being the king. I'm going to be the king. And Satan goes over there and he tempts Adam and Eve. And Eve sin and they lose the kingdom to Satan. You say, how do you know that? In Matthew chapter number 4, Satan takes Jesus on top of the temple. He says, fall down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world for they are mine and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Second Corinthians chapter number 4, he's called the God of this world. He's a king and he has dominion over this world right now. So when you begin to study this thing about kings and kingdoms, you have four books in your Bible that are just dealing with kings. The reason that thing is so important is because there's coming a king one day that is going to rule and take over this world. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so we have the Davidic covenant. We have all these promises about those kind of things. And then we know what takes place with the study of the kings. I mean, if you've read your Kings and Chronicles, I mean, it's a pretty, uh, pretty bad stuff going on. I mean, some of these kings are killing each other. There's, there's conspiracies. There's treachery. There's all kind of things that take place with the kings. But you have a split in the kingdom after Solomon. You have Solomon and Rehoboam. And after Solomon goes, you have Rehoboam. And there's a split in the kingdom. You have the northern tribes and the southern tribes. you got the Yankees and the Confederates. Amen. And the Confederates... The, the southerners, the tribe of Judah and, and Benjamin and Simeon down in there, 
They're the ones that keep the temple. They keep the tabernacle. And they keep the Levites and all those ordinances there. And things are traced through that southern tribe of Judah because those are still successive kings. The, the northern tribes, man, it's, it's craziness. You don't have succession as far as the kings go. You have somebody kill somebody and he'll take over. You know, Omni, he'll go kill somebody and he takes over. He, uh, I think it's Tibni. He kills Tibni, he takes over. Then Omni's son, he takes over after him. That's Ahab. But you'll have that kind of stuff going on in the northern kingdom. In the southern kingdom, which is Judah, they're the true line. But when you get to a fellow named Jeconiah, Jeconiah offends God so much because of the destruction that he sends to the word of God. God says, you know what? He's not even going to be buried with a barrel. He's going to be buried, not going to be buried with the kings. He's going to be buried with the barrel of an ass. And he takes his name off of it. Jeconiah, J-E, that stands for Jehovah. God says, he ain't Jeconiah no more. He's Coniah. And he says, no man's going to prosper and rule anymore reigning on the throne of David. So God basically curses the throne. So how is Jesus going to come if he comes from the seed of David, of Judah, and reign on the throne when God's done cursed the throne? Here's the answer. It's the virgin birth. When Jesus is born, he's not born of, of a man and a woman. He's born of the Holy Ghost. So his father is not Adam. His father's God. He bypasses Jeconiah. He bypasses all those kings of Judah. But his lineage through his mother is traced back to David. Mary is of the lineage of David. That's why she had to go to Bethlehem. So when Jesus comes, he's born king of the Jews. He's the rightful heir. The only one that is the rightful heir because of his seed. He's a son of God. So we have the birth of the king. That's why there's so much emphasis in the reading of the, of the first part of the Christmas story about the king of the Jews because this thing is about who's in control. Who is going to rule and reign as king? And he comes, and obviously Jesus Christ is born. He lives a sinless life. He goes through his life, and as the only begotten Son of God, remember way back we talked about Lucifer and the sons of God? We talked about Adam being a son of God, Luke chapter number 3, the last verse in that chapter. We, when we get saved, we're said to be a son of God. To them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. But Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. That's very important. So he comes and he preaches and you know what happens. The Jews don't receive him. They don't want him to be the king. They say, we have no king but Caesar. And instead of giving him the king of king title, they give him the crown of thorns and they crucify their king. And he dies on the cross. But there's a lot going on when he dies on the cross. You see, he had to die on the cross to redeem all of mankind. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter number 3. He's the promised redeemer. He is the lamb of God mentioned there in Exodus 12 with the Passover lamb. In order to have our sins taken away, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it. Just keeping the law couldn't do it. It had to be the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. So he came. He lived a sinless life that we couldn't live. He died a death that he didn't deserve. He died our death. In other words, we deserve to be killed. We deserve to be crucified. We deserve to go to hell. He died in our place. That's what it means by Christ died for our sins. He died a substitution for us. So he died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. You can't keep a good man down. Amen? He is the only good man. Not only is he the good man, he's the God man. God manifest in the flesh. He went in the grave. He rose again. Now when this took place, since Israel had rejected their king, God had put them off. So the kingdom that's promised under this Davidic covenant and the fulfillment of all these promises that God told Abraham, which, by the way, haven't been fulfilled yet, all the stuff's put on hold. And we're living in a time right now that's called Israel's blindness. Romans chapter number 11. He says, Israel is blind in part until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And what you have through the book of Acts is a progression of rejection from the nation of Israel to their Messiah. And they say, we don't even want Jesus now. All the early church were Jews. All the apostles were Jews. So what happens is God says, okay, you don't want this now? We're going to stop the clock for a minute, and we're going to deal with the Gentiles that we didn't deal with way back here. Remember back when he called Abraham? He says, basically, if you're going to be blessed, you're going to have to bless Abraham. You're going to have to follow Abraham. You're going to have to be a blessing to the Jews. Now, you know what God said in the past 2,000 years? He said, okay, Gentiles, you come in. Jews, you stay out. And he gives the Gentiles a chance. This is called the church age. It's a mystery. When you get saved, you're not joining a kingdom where you can take up arms and go try to fight the Muslims. Like the crusades, you know. We're here bringing in the kingdom for Christ. No, it's not that way. When you get saved, you're put in a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. One day we're going to see the physical kingdom, but right now we're in a spiritual kingdom. We're not here to take up arms. We're spreading the gospel by our mouths, by preaching. It's a spiritual thing. So we have the church age, and this is what's called the new covenant. The first glimpse of the new covenant is over in Jeremiah chapter 33. And you have the division of the covenant given. 
as a division to the church and a division to the Jews. And the reason this is so very important is because if you don't make the division of rightly dividing the word of truth, then you'll have conflict here. God deals with the church differently than He deals with the nation of Israel. For instance, He never said to us as believers in Christ, I'm going to give you a certain piece of land. I'm going to destroy your enemies physically. No, that's not what He did. He gave us spiritual blessings. So that division of the new covenant is different. Remember when He instituted the new covenant? He sat down with His disciples and they, they had the Lord's Supper there and they passed the juice around and they broke the bread and they drank it. And He says, I'm instituting this new covenant, this new testament. The new testament was put in force when He died. And we're under that new covenant, that new testament. And this is the church age. That's the first division of it. You get saved by grace through faith and the finished work of Christ. There's no keeping the Sabbath. There's no going to the temple. This is way different than what took place back over here. And back over here, you had to go to the temple. You couldn't just worship God anywhere. You had to go to the temple. You had to keep the sacrifices to do the sacrifices that were prescribed in the law. You had to keep that Old Testament law. Over here, it's about grace and faith in the finished work of Christ. You've got to see yourself as a sinner and Christ as a Savior. That's the new covenant for the church, the body of Christ. Well, how does the Bible progress from there? The end of this age, which I believe is drawing very near to the end, there's going to be a rapture of, of saved believers. There will be a resurrection of those that are dead in Christ. We'll go on to see the Lord, and then the next phase will take place. It's called the Great Tribulation. We've been teaching through this in Sunday school in the book of Revelation. So we move on from where we are presently to over here in the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. God begins dealing with the Jews again. Right now, we're kind of the, the clock's been stopped. The prophetic calendar, the prophetic clock has been stopped, and God's been letting, letting us get in. He's been dealing with the Gentiles. But after we're raptured, the fullness of the Gentiles will be come in, and he will start dealing with the Jews again, the time of Jacob's trouble. This is when the earth's going to reel and rot. The Bible says it'll reel fro, back and fro like a drunkard. This is when there'll be signs in the heavens. I believe there'll be catastrophic things that'll take place as far as the sun, as far as meteorites hitting the earth. All kind of things will take place. Probably all your electricity will be gone. All those kind of things will take place on the earth at that time. And the Bible talks about it being distre- an earth that is distressed in the book of Luke. So it's a time of judgment on the earth. It's also a time when the Antichrist tries one last time, when Satan himself, through the Antichrist, tries to take over. Because just like God has a son, his only begotten son of God, Satan himself has a seed that we read all the way back over here in Genesis 3.15. He says, thy seed, talking to the serpent, Satan has a son. And his name's given in John chapter 6. Now this, this son is going to be born... And he's called the, the son of perdition. He's going to be a, a ruler that all the world will like. They will follow him. He will be that type of personality. He probably will be a sodomite. The Bible says he will not regard the love of women, uh, nor the worship the God of his fathers, but he'll worship the God of forces. And he's going to come on the scene and he'll bring a uh, supposed peace. And this Antichrist will attempt to take over. As you read about in Isaiah 14, to exalt his throne, just like Satan's been trying to do. This will be his last-ditch effort to take over the world. And, of course, it's not going to work. At the end of this thing, Jesus Christ is going to return in judgment. The second advent of Christ, the Bible says, "...in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power." He'll return, he'll destroy the Antichrist, put him and, him and the false prophet in the lake of fire. He will put Satan in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And when his foot lands on that Mount of Olives, just like when the woman touched him and the virtue went out and healed her, virtue from his body will go out into the land. This land's going to be... I mean, it talks about the water turning to blood. It talks about a third of all the creatures in the, in the ocean dying, a third of the population dying. This land's going to be a mess. But when he sets foot on it and his virtue goes out, he's going to heal the land. And the earth will be regenerated and born at once, born again. As far as that, it will be rejuvenated. We've studied that some this morning in Sunday school, and he'll rule and reign for a thousand years. But just like every age, he starts off perfect over here. It messes up. He judges it. He starts off perfect over here, puts Adam and Eve. I mean, here's Eve. She has no competition. She looks in the water whenever she gets ready in the morning, and she gets jealous. She's Ms. Universe. He's Mr. Universe. They blow it. He says, okay, I'm going to judge this thing 1,700 years go by, long-suffering of God. Then he sets up Noah and says, okay, you've got a clean start, be fruitful, multiply, replace. They get together and he says, oh, I'm going to have to judge them again. He separates them. He separates man according to the sons. He separates the sons of Adam according to the, the tribes of Jacob, which is 12 divisions. He separates them, scatters them apart the face of the earth. 
Then he tries to, he says, okay, Abraham, I'm going to start it again. He takes Abraham, okay, Abraham, you follow me. And Abraham begins to follow him, and they come out, and they get down to Egypt, and they start mingling with the Egyptians. We want to go back to Egypt. No, oh, it was so good down there. And they bring all the false gods and false idols. Exodus 32, they make up a golden calf. He says, forget this mess. You can't serve me unless I put rules and regulations. He's got a judgment, put rules and regulations. They don't even keep the rules and regulations. By the time Christ shows up, they have done, added all these things to the Mosaic law. That's why you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had all these sects, all these extra laws and religions that they had added to what Moses had written. They, man messes it up every time. So he says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a new thing. I'm going to form a body of Christ, people that believe in me by faith and what I did on the cross. They can have eternal life. They can follow me and they can preach the truth. What do they do? The last days, perilous times shall come. The church goes into absolute apostasy. We have people now that are Christians that don't even believe God gave them a Bible. Believers that don't even believe you have a Bible. Absolute apostasy. Believers that come to church and they want it to be like the world. They want to listen to the same kind of music. They want to look the same, act the same. We're in apostasy. The thing's ruined again. He says, okay, I'm going to take you up to heaven. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to bring you through the judgment seat of Christ, get things right. I'm going to come back to this earth. When he comes back to this earth, boy, does he find it in rough shape. Man, when, he, when, the, when the body of Christ leaves and the church is gone, this thing goes to pot. The, Antichrist, the devil takes over. The whole world says, okay, the church ain't here to keep us in line. We're tired of them talking about our sins anyway. You know, they're judging us all the time. Then the Antichrist shows up and the whole world worships the beast. He comes and he says, okay, I'm going to take care of the Antichrist. He throws him in the lake of fire, throws the false prophet, Balaam, in the lake of fire. He sets up a perfect environment, puts Satan in the bottomless pit. All the unclean spirits, Zechariah 13, are departed out of the land. He rules and reigns as absolute dictator, pure, perfect dictator for a thousand years. What happens at the end of that? They rebel. We can't stand this Jewish dictator. Satan comes out and he deceives the four quarters of the nations. After a thousand years of peace and prosperity. One thousand years. And they all gather together to go try to destroy Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 20. And the Bible describes that last battle like this. <laughs> I love it. Real simple. And fire came down from God out of heaven and consumed them. <laughs> Just <pfft. laughs> The Lord said enough with this. <laughs> and what happens? He burns it up. Second Peter chapter 3. Heavens and earth pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works of the shall be burned up. I, John, saw a new, uh, a new heavens and a new earth. So he destroys the thing. He sets up the judgment. Revelation chapter number 20. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things written in the book according to their works. The sea gave the dead which in them. Death and hell delivered the dead which in them. were judged every man according to his works. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I, John, saw new heavens and a new earth. The first heaven, first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. New earth. He finally fixes the thing after all that. So we go from the beginning through all these judgments and we finally...